help. One, you can be praying for the people that are impacted there. We want you to participate in this by being positioned and ready to go. This is going to be a long-term response. It's going to take years, and we want to mobilize as many throughout our Southern Baptist family as possible. We ask for your patience, we ask for your willingness to go, and we look forward to seeing you serve as we try to minister to the needs of the countless thousands and even millions that have been impacted by this flooding and this storm. Good morning. If you are like I am, you have been astounded by the footage that we have seen um, in Texas where I, I recall one that st sticks out in my mind, an intersection where the traffic lights are sort of even with the boats as all the boats are coming through. And so uh, we have been praying. We're trying to determine what we can assist in the future. 24 25.5 trillion gallons of rain, 25.5 trillion. Now, I don't think we have an exact, the Lord has great power, um, but we're trying to figure out how all we might can assist there. We were blessed this past Wednesday night. Um, Hannah, I'm looking for Hannah, I don't see her. Hannah King had, um, she's not feeling well this morning. She uh, got in touch with me early in the week and was burdened with what she was seeing, and so she baked a bunch of cookies, and we in our prayer meeting time, and uh, some of you in Awana might have got in on that as well, but we raised about $300 on the spot, and we're going to be giving from the church budget, and we're going to be asking us as members to give toward a special offering, not today, so you can go ahead and do that today, but all of that, and what I wanted you to hear from the North American Mission Board part of that is we support every month through our tithes and offerings a significant percentage of our monthly gifts go to the North American Mission Board, so we're already making a difference there financially. Please continue to pray. We'll talk to you about special offering opportunity in the future, and Lord willing, I would, I've reached out to some pastor friends, our team or teams in the future when uh, some dust settles there on how we can go and assist. So well, we wanted to make you aware of that need, and uh, we just want to keep our yes on the table. So be praying, and let's discuss what all our obedience, being doers of the word, could entail to um, assist brothers and sisters and those that are um, walking in darkness in, uh, in Texas. I am grateful. I just mentioned to you, Mr. Randy, Miss Phyllis' son, Bradley, and um, his wife and boys, their water got within about two inches of their home, and uh, their home stayed dry, and Miss Phyllis told me they were just able to get back in end of the week. So uh, I know we've Andy Brink, Andy and Catherine in that area. Grover's got some family, so thank you for praying, and we'll continue to do that. So wanted to mention that to you at the top uh, as, as we start here this morning. And then also want to pause. God has been so good to, um, to bless us with so many guests. And guests, you are welcome here. We're grateful to God that you have joined us for the Lord's Day worship. And uh, if you live in town, you can certainly make that a norm and uh, be part of us every Lord's Day. And I'll just remind you that we have a uh, Discovering Logos, what we call our new members class, coming up two weeks from today. And I know we've got about um, 20 or so people signed up for that and about that many little ones. So that announcement, let me remind you that that would include we'll provide lunch for you and child care. So we'll be happy to um, take care of your kids during that um, that new members class. And then the last thing I'll say announcement-wise before we pray is uh, small groups. So tonight we don't have corporate worship with it being a holiday weekend. And uh, we've been worshiping corporately here, but for the next several weeks we start small groups next Sunday night. And you'll find in your bulletin a list of the small group leaders and the six locations where small groups will be happening. And so you can sign up on the uh, sign-up sheets out uh, there in the lobby area and hope you'll be part of one of those small groups. What a privilege it is to worship together. I'm going to ask Mr. Stan if he would come and pray for us as we worship the Lord. And our custom men, if you'll come join with me here at the front, we'll kneel before the Lord. And ladies, would you uh, pray there where you are? Father, as we come this morning, 
to uh, to worship. <clears throat> we um, we pray that we're coming with willing hearts to hear what you have to say to us. Father, we pray that we're coming with hearts willing to sacrifice both our money you've given us, the time you've given us, the talents and gifts you've given us. Father, I pray that today we would hear your word as we look at Habakkuk. We know that we're learning about your character and how you are a just God, Father, that we would take that to heart and allow it to impact the way we live our lives. Father, for those in our um, family today, our church family that are hurting, we lift them to you. Father, we have Derek and his family to you this morning. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in that situation. Give them strength, give them mercy, show them grace. Father, lift Shannon and Jeff and Jim and the rest of the family to you this morning. Pray the same thing for them, Lord. I pray for strength and mercy and grace. We go to this time of worship, time of preaching, Lord. I pray that you would strengthen David. He would boldly proclaim your word. We would hear what you have to say. Ask these things in your son's name. Amen. I invite you to join with me and stand together this morning as we sing. Our God is a mighty fortress. He's a bulwark that never fails. He's a great God. He deserves all praise this morning, all glory. He is worthy. I sing. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never failed. He. Our helper, He amid the flood, a mortal.
all worthy of all praises. Amen. Sing together. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for He is Thy health and salvation. All ye who God's word from Romans 3, 23, it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be both the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. And we remind ourselves this morning that our sins are real, our sins are many, but his mercy is more. Amen. If you don't know this one, learn this with us. could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all-knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins they are many his mercy is more praise the lord Mercy is more stronger than darkness, new every morn. Since they are many, his mercy is more. What patience 
would wait as we constantly mourn. What Father so tender is calling us home. He welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is for your singing. You may be seated. I'm going to be reading from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 28 through 39. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you um, for the love that we have for each other as a family here at Logos. Lord, I thank you for your uh, gift, Lord, the salvation 
Uh, dear Lord, that you give to us uh, freely if we just accept it. I thank you for this church being mission-minded. Lord, I do pray for the people that are affected um, out in Texas, Louisiana. Dear Lord, help us to remember that we are just pilgrims, strangers passing through. Uh, dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the promises that you've given us. Dear Lord, ask your blessings upon the uh, offerings at this time. In your name we pray. Amen.
Amen, amen. Indeed, God is sovereign over us. God is sovereign over all. We rest in that great truth today. If you have a copy of God's Word, we are more blessed than we realize because a lot of places they either do not have Scripture in their language or they do not possess a copy of God's Word. So we're blessed to have our Bibles. Hold your Bible up. If you have a Bible, hold your Bible up. Isn't that a beautiful sight? I'm hundreds of Bibles. Praise the Lord. If you don't have one, let us know. We'll get you one if um, you're not able to have a copy of God's Word. Would you turn to the Old Testament book of Habakkuk? Habakkuk. The, it's in the Minor Prophets. If you go about to Matthew, hang a left and turn back. It's the eighth Minor Prophet, a short, one of the shortest Minor Prophets. And let me just remind you, we call those books Minor Prophets because of the length of the book, not because, you know, they were the B team and Isaiah and Jeremiah were the A team and we couldn't hear from the A team. So they're all A team. It's all God's word and glorious. And this morning we're um, to Habakkuk 3. Habakkuk 3 is where we'll be. And we're going to think about some truths to cling to in life's darkest hours. Truths that we can hang on to in life's darkest hours, and you might be thinking, in fact, I hope you are, that um, even the sound of me making that statement, I hope you're at a place where you say, dude, I don't know anything about dark hours. I haven't seen any dark hours, right? Praise the Lord if you're in that season. But um, life has um, those hours that are glorious, but life has dark hours, and we're going to see. You know, I've thought much about Habakkuk and um, our study of this minor prophet. And, uh, so many times, I think, I, let me just make a statement. We have a, a tendency to neglect the Old Testament in general, and we have a tendency to neglect the minor prophets in particular. And so if we're not careful, we'll neglect this portion of Scripture to our peril. And uh, so with Habakkuk and the minor prophets, I've thought we get instruction that is an antidote for taking God lightly. The prophets, I think, give us a great antidote. They, they discourage us from the human tendency, the cultural tendency that we have to take God lightly. We have a general in our flesh that's this tendency to esteem ourselves highly. We do. We're, we're prone, or prone, very prone to pride. And uh, the minor prophets... Um, as we'll see even in this passage this morning, will will serve us well in crushing that tendency we have toward pride and seeing God. Our great hope in life's darkest hours are, is, is our ability that God's given us to be able to see God as he is, which if we will see God as he is, all of our perspective of ourself and our problems we put in a different light we can see God the way we need to. So let me give you a little bit of backdrop if you're with us and if you haven't been with us in uh, recent weeks. And if you have been with us in recent weeks, let me ground our context. So what had started out in uh, Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 1 really was the prophet saying, God, why do you not hear my prayer? Why do you not answer? All day long I'm praying. And God, we'd had this great revival in Judah. And Judah has just gone to hell It's gone down the tube and immorality and violence and the culture's just broken. God, why do you not answer? That was the prophet's first complaint that we get in Habakkuk 1. And God says a couple of verses later, I am going to do something. I'm going to act. And by the way, Habakkuk's desire was for God to bring back the revival. You know, it was the good old days in Josiah's reign and Lord, take us back there. It's a noble complaint prayer. I don't begrudge Habakkuk at at all for thinking that way. And God answers and God says, I'm about to do something that is going to blow your mind. He says that is unbelievable. And he proceeds to tell the prophet that he is going to raise up a, a, a nation that is not really a significant nation at that point, but God's going to raise up the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, And he's going to use that nation to greatly punish Judah, to turn his people to him. And so that's the first complaint. The second complaint, 
chapter 2, really, we get the second complaint of Habakkuk. Aren't you grateful that God doesn't throw away complainers? <laughs> right? That's just an application. Hey, God doesn't like, you complainer, be gone. Right? Because prone to complain, I am. Um, he doesn't throw away complainers. So he hears how good and gracious God is. And he hears this complaint of the prophet. And the second complaint is, now Habakkuk, his, his thinking is being shaped is, okay, God, I know we're bad, but the Chaldeans, they're worse. God, you know, we're bad, but they're evil. They're wicked. They take men up with fish hooks, catch them in the net. They, they are bad. God says, again, graciously, that, by the way, when I'm through using the Chaldeans for my purposes, I'll deal with them. You ever been like, you know, a kid, I think, growing up, you're like, well, Pam did so, and so daddy's like, when I get through beating you, I'll talk to Pam, you know, probably is what happened, but something like that. Pam didn't do much wrong in our house. Trust me, that's the truth. That's not joking, but um, it's like God's like, I, I got this thing, Habakkuk, and so then we get to Habakkuk 2.4. And we get this glorious truth that the stream runs all the way to the cross of Jesus Christ. And it runs all throughout the New Testament. And it's a cornerstone of our faith. Chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. So there's proud people. You'll meet proud people. And proud people have a sick soul. Proud people have a sick soul. Their soul's not right. And God gives us really chap, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, I should say, all the way down to verse 19, telling us through the prophet how he's going to deal with the proud one. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. Now, the end of chapter 2, verse 4 is where I want to get, but the righteous will live by his faith. The justified ones, those that have been justified, they're going to live, they're going to be sustained, and it's, it's God who's going to do that graciously and mercifully, and through our faith, we're able to endure and conquer. Then we get to Habakkuk 3. I know you're saying this is a long introduction. You're thinking like, oh, that early lunch is looking unlikely. But um, what we've got, this is probably one of the most fun words. Do you like fun words? Uh, some of you, you young boys, would be like, I don't even need to get you started. You know, fun words. Shiganoth. Say Shiganoth. Shiganoth. We've got a Shiganoth this morning. How many of you, this? go, go in tomorrow. You want to have some fun? Go in tomorrow and be like, we talk about Shiganoth at our church Sunday. Do you know anything about that? And people be like, dude, what kind of church do you go to? Say, man, we need to look at Habakkuk together. So look at Habakkuk 3.1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shiganoth. What in the world is that word? The only other occurrence of that word is in Psalm 7. And the singular, a different tense of that word, Shiganon. Shiganoth and Shiganon. So Shiganoth. What is a Shiganoth? Uh, I wanted Stephen, I wanted to put him on the spot. Like, hey, Stephen, come up and tell everybody what Shiganoth is since that's musical. He's like, dude, I don't know. Um, but a Shiganoth is some kind of music, some kind of hymn that's set to music. And so what we have this morning, I want you to see this. And I'm going to show you in the text. It's a prayer. It's a prayer that is a carefully composed prayer. It's not a, a, an immediate prayer. It's a carefully composed prayer that... Habakkuk carefully wrote, God had him right. And it's for, we have a choir director. Steve does, Stephen does a great job directing our choir. Look at chapter 3, verse 19. For the choir director on my stringed instruments. The people of God are about to go into a time of great judgment and punishment. It's going to be hard. And God's giving them this beautiful prayer that they can sing about the truths of God, those that will sustain them during this time. But some of the questions that our prayer is going to answer, truths to cling to in life's darkest hour is, here's what the prophet asked that's so apt and relevant for our, our day. Why is God sometimes slow to answer our prayer? You ever feel that way? God, God I pray, nothing changes. I just, I pray, no, why is God slow? Why does evil prosper? Why does evil prosper? You just look around the world. You look in your own life, your own family, your own relationships. You look at the world at large. You look at our nation. Why, why is evil prosper? Why, in the midst of that, God, we know you're powerful. Why don't you intervene and do something? You ever think that? God, God it's just it's broken. And, and then this, if we're really honest, and let's be honest, in the midst of working through some of those questions, and a question Habakkuk works through, I think, is, God, does it really pay to trust you? 
And it, that, that's a core question, isn't it? Because God, sometimes, you know, I, I, I read in your word, you know everything that's going on, but a lot of this stuff that I'm dealing with, I didn't see it coming. I don't like it. It's painful. In fact, God, I hate it. God, it hurts. God, I can't change it. Does it pay to trust you, God? That, that's, I love the honesty of Scripture. And so God has answered coming punishment on Judah by way of the Chaldeans. God's going to act. Dark, dark days are coming. And before we camp out in three, let me show you a couple more verses. Look at chapter 2, verse 18. I'm going to tell you, and I was so blessed uh, by Alistair Begg's sermon, a number of sermons on Habakkuk. We'll have one more to go. We'll finish next week. But I want you to think about, look at Habakkuk 2, verse 18. What prophet is the idol when its maker has carved it? An image, a teacher of falsehood, its maker trusting his own handiwork when he fashioned speechless idols. I want you to think about that idolatry that we talked about last week. And you know why a lot of people, most people are not making wooden idols in our day. That's not a normative thing in our culture. But they do find idolatry in materialism or in relationships or accomplishment or job or school or spouse or girlfriend, boyfriend or social media. We're looking for something other than God because, see, if we have a false God, we're not accountable to him. Right? I want you to think about that. If you make a piece of wood, you're not accountable to that piece of wood. In fact, if you make a piece of wood, you get tired of that piece of wood, what can you do with it? You can just, you can like put it in the fireplace, couldn't you? You can do something else with it. But you know, Habakkuk lands before his prayer in 2.20. He says, let me tell you something. As opposed to those false gods who have no breath at all inside it, but the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth be silent before him. And he, let me just tell us all this this morning loud and clear. There is a God. He is sovereign over us. He is sovereign over all. He is in his temple, and we are wise to trust him. On the best day and on the worst day, he is worthy of our trust. In fact, you're going to see where the Shiganoth ends is not only is he worthy of our trust, but let me tell you, on the worst day, you know what wise men and women do on the worst day? They worship him. That's what, that's what wise men, on the, in the darkest hour, we are wise to worship. So truths to cling to in life's darkest hours. Let me read for us the word of the Lord from Habakkuk 3, 1 through 15. Would you stand if you're able to do that in honor of God's word as I read these 15 verses? Habakkuk 3, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shiganoth. Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Cushion under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers, or was your anger against the rivers, or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? The, your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. Selah. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In, 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 in indignation, you marched through the earth. In anger, you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck, Selah. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devoured the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross where in wrath, God, you remembered mercy. Holy Spirit, we acknowledge as we read this passage that apart from your divine illumination, we will not understand your word. So we pray, God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, hearts to obey all that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated and let's think truths to cling to in life's darkest hours. Let me just be candid about our study of the minor prophets. They will be humbling because uh, we covered a lot of ground there. We won't unpack every word of that, but it's, um, it's not readily apparent, likely at first reading, what all is going on there. So I've, got, I've broken this into three points that I trust the Lord are faithful to the text that I want us to consider. And, and by the way, I'd like for you to think if you are in that place where you said, hey, I'm just going to tell you, at our house, Life is just great. We had not seen a problem in a long time, and there's not one on the horizon. I want you to pack this in your heart and mind, this passage and these truths. And by the way, I think about our church and about our own family, and I think of those that are um, struggling or dying or hanging on by a thread. It's a very relevant and timely truth, but truths to cling to in life's darkest hours. And the first one I want you to see is a great blessing. Number one, God will hear and answer the humble prayer of his people. What a blessing it is. We take that for granted. God will both hear and answer the humble prayer of his people. Habakkuk has given complaint to God, and God's answered. It wasn't the answer he was looking for. It often is not. God's get, uh, Habakkuk's giving complaint to God, and God's answered. And now he gets to the place, and I want you to see uh, drop down to chapter 3, verse 16. I want you to see we're going to unpack 3, 16 through 19 next week, Lord willing. And we need to set in context, uh, context. It's not like Habakkuk is distant and remote. He is living in the midst of Judah. And Judah is a horrible, broken place. Immorality, as mentioned, violence, injustice all around. And God has said, not only am I not going to fix it, the way that you would have me fix it, but I am about to bring heavy-duty punishment on you by the way of the Chaldeans. You all are about to experience that. And so when you get to chapter 3, verse 16, look at his response. Here's his, his demeanor. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble. Have you ever been in a place where you got the news or you were inexperienced, and you literally, it's like your knees buckled? You know, that, that phone call that changed everything, that conversation at work, or that diagnosis, or the doctor saying, look, I've got some bad news for you or your loved one, or, or that husband or that wife giving you that news, and I'm just going to tell you, in that moment, your world was shattered. That's not the exact context, but there's application to the context that I described because the prophet's saying he has heard God and he's worshiping, but what he's just about heard, he is shaking like a leaf. That's the demeanor of the prophet when we get to this first truth. God will hear and answer the humble prayer of his people. So it's a prayer. It's a prayer of Habakkuk. Again, only two occurrences of the word Habakkuk in the Bible, chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 3, verse 1. He's the prophet, and it's according to Shiganoth, okay? It's, a, it's going to be the choir director's going to lead this. By the way, they had an orchestra because it's going to be led on stringed instruments for the corporate assembly of the people of God. That's cool. The choir director, you all take this truth and sing it. So this beautiful prayer, and by the way, it's not a spontaneous prayer. Have you ever talked to people said, you know, I was bothered with that brother. He, he, had, he had written out a prayer, and he prayed that. It wasn't spontaneous. You know, I want to tell you there's a place for spontaneous prayers and there's a place for composed prayers, and this is a carefully composed prayer. So if you've got a problem with composed prayers, you've got a problem with the Bible. I mean, just so application. So God had him write this prayer down. He put a lot of thought and effort in. And by the way, it, there's a, totally a place for when our knees buckle, it's just without rehearsal pouring out our heart to God. Right? So it's a both and reality. So it's a carefully composed poem, prayer, 
And by the way, well, we'll get there in a minute. Look down. Let's go and get there now. Look at verse 3. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. How many of you notice when you're reading in the um, Psalms frequently, when you're reading here in Habakkuk, at each one of these different stanzas of the poem, you get Selah. And have you ever wondered, like, what's up with the Selah? Right? Selah. Selah, we don't know exactly, but it seems to be in poet, poetry, scripture, that genre, that, that it seems to have the meaning as, as best we can surmise, sort of pause, ponder, and worship. So you're reading, reading Selah, pause, ponder there. That's a stop. God comes from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Perrin, Selah, right? So, and, and again, this is a poem. That's what we're, we're um, handling. So the prophet has no complaint now. Look at verse 2. We're going to close with a passage out of Job. This sounds so familiar to Job. Lord, I've heard the report about you, and I fear. That's a good place. Lord, I, I, I've heard about you, but God, I'm now walking in this reverential fear of you. I, literally, some of your translations, literally, I stand in awe of you. I stand in awe of you. So, where he had begun with an attitude that we're better than the Chaldeans, he's been humbled. And I love Job's testimony over there in the end of Job. We'll look at the start of Job at the end of the sermon. But Job's testimony of his experience with God, listen to what Job said in Job 42, verse 5. I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. I'd heard about you, God, but now i got firsthand experiential. God, I have seen you. But at this first point, God will hear and answer the humble prayer of his people. And what we have is a prayer, a poem, a psalm, but a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to Shigonoth. Lord, I've heard the report about you and I fear. And look at this. Oh, Lord, you're not done with your people. Jehovah, Yahweh, revive. Sovereign Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years. Make it known. And by the way, this would be our tagline coming away from the sermon. Just etch this in your brain. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. Let me tell you what the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about. In the midst of God's wrath, he remembered mercy. Right? The wrath was going to be there because of his holiness, because of his perfection. But in wrath, God has remembered mercy. I like what Boyce said about this first point about God hearing and answering the humble prayer of his people. He said, the only way, listen to this, the only way we dare approach God is humbly. And the only way we can rightly present our petitions is with the utterance, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I'm going to tell you, it's not, hey, God, we are your followers. We, we serve your church faithfully. We give generously to your work. God, we are, we are mission-minded people. We take your word seriously. And God, we are faithful people. We serve you. That's not why God hears our prayers. The prayer that God will hear is, God, would you be merciful to me, a sinner? The first point is God will hear and answer the humble prayer of his people. So in that darkest hour, we need to follow Habakkuk's example and pray. But number two, God's faithfulness in the past assures his trustworthiness for the future. God's faithfulness in the past assures his trustworthiness for the future. I remember we used to interview a lot in my corporate work. We hired a lot of people, and uh, one of the things we'd say, I've thought about this uh, this week, we would say, as you're sitting and interviewing people, if you ask people in an interview setting like, hey, what are you going to do for our organization? If we give you this job and, and this um, uh compensation package, and we bring you on board, what are you going to do? And everybody you talk to, they were going to do great, great things. In fact, we say about interview, it's like wedding day. That sounds bad. I it's like the bride's really not that pretty all the time. Right? She's not that pretty on Monday morning. I hope I'm not getting in trouble. Right? That's not how you look. Uh, Monday morning, 6.30, clock going off. Most brides, you'd be like, is that the same girl? It, it is, but that's just normal. So I'd say interview day is like wedding day. And so if you talk to people on interview day, you'd be like, how, how well are you going to perform? Like, dude, I'm a hard worker. What kind of weakness do you have? I work too hard and have too positive an attitude. Oh, man, we need to hire you. <laughs> yeah, just like somebody told you to say that. And, um, and, and so that, that interview day, and, but we said, don't, 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 don't go to interviews and ask people what they're going to do. Go to interviews and ask people what they have done. Because the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. Okay, now, the grace of God saves us. If we're ashamed of our past, God's grace is greater. But I want to tell you, 
One of the main indicators of God's future faithfulness is God's past faithfulness. And you know what he tells Habakkuk to write down in the prayer? Here's what God says, and I'm going to show you this in the text. Look at, all that I, look at all that I have done to this point to both rescue my people and to crush my enemies. And that's what I'm going to show you in here. So I'm going to tell you this morning in that darkest hour when everything seems to be falling apart and you're like, I didn't see this coming. I don't like it. I can't change it. I'm going down. You can grab a hold of truths where they can settle our soul. We got to have hidden these and say, let me tell you something. This is a surprise to me, but this is not a surprise to God. And he knows and he cares and he's present and he's with me and we stand on his past faithfulness and know that he is trustworthy for the future. Let me show you this. Look at Habakkuk 3, verse 3. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Let me tell you, we just ran past something that's beautiful. The prophet's suffering. You know what God said for him to write down in a prayer? God comes. Now, I want you to think about that. Let's, let's, let's think about God. What if we want to go to God? Can we do that? You think about like, hey, how would we go to God? We couldn't go to God unless God, I want you to think about this, unless God came to us. And you know what the prayer says? Where God, this is a picture of his glory. This is a picture of God's glory. And I want you to know the God of the Bible, mark this, is a coming down God. And if he's not a coming down God, there's no hope because we could not be a going up people. And the only one that has, right, the only one that has, ascended and descended is God. And we can't, uh, you know, this idea that let's build a bridge. I want to tell you, God's got to build the bridge or the bridge won't be built. And I love what the prophet says right here in his prayer. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Now, let me tell you what's going on in 3 through 7. I'm going to give you really 3 through 15. We're getting instances where God is saying in past history, here's what I have done. Who is it that parts seas? Who is it that lets rivers be divided and people cross on dry ground? Who is it that stops the sun in the middle of the day and gives an extra day? God says, that is me. That's what he's saying. And by the way, he is trustworthy. So let's unpack this. God comes from Teman and the Holy One from Mount Paran. Selah. Now, I want you to see what that resonates back to. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 33, and what this is, what we've got here is looking back on the Lord's coming at Sinai, and what we've got, Habakkuk's taking us to a picture of the glory of God in his coming. Mark that. It's a picture of the glory of God in his coming. And so, when he came at Mount Sinai, look at Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. The Lord came from Sinai and dawned on them from Seir, he shone forth from Mount Paran. By the way, that just reading almost word for word with Habakkuk 3.3. And he came from the midst. Look at this. Where did God come from when he came from Sinai? He came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. What a picture. Isaiah gets a glimpse. Holy, holy, holy. So he came from the midst of 10,000 holy ones. At his right hand, there was flashing lightning for them. So I want you to see in this verse 3, God comes and the Lord has come, the Lord will come. And so let's keep going. His splendor, middle of verse 3, covers the heavens. The earth is full of his praise. So God comes down and his splendor covers all the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like sunlight. He has rays flashing. Some of you say light like lightning bolts, rays flashing from his hand. There's the hiding of his power. And then verse 5 we go to the exodus from Egypt. Look at this. This will harken back. How in the world can God get his people out of Egypt? Well, let me tell you, God's big enough. He will send them out of Egypt bearing gifts. How about that? He will. It's like your neighbor come to you like, dude, will you take all this gold and silver with us as you leave? Thank you. That, that, you go read that account. And so he doesn't give us that whole account, but that's what the prophet is telling us. Look at verse 5. Before him goes pestilence. And plague comes after him. So he delivered his people from Egypt by way of pestilence and plague. And, and, and what Habakkuk's saying in this second point, God's faithfulness in the past, assures his trustworthiness 
for the future. Habakkuk's saying in these verses, here's God's resume. Here's God's track record. Here's who he is. Verse 6, he stood and surveyed the earth. So it's a picture of God coming down to his creation. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. And look at God as opposed to false gods who have no breath at all. Inside it, verse 19 of chapter 2, God, his ways are everlasting. The prophet says, I saw the tents of Cushion under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. And so God's faithfulness in the past guarantees, commits his trustworthiness for the future. And Habakkuk saying, I'm going to trust you, God, because I know what you're doing. So we look back and you're in Egypt and you're stuck in Egypt. Does God know what he's doing? Joseph, you're being imprisoned and you're being falsely accused and every step of the way we're questioning, is God trustworthy? And God is trustworthy. And the prophet says, I'm going to trust you because you know what you're doing and God has come and he will come again. Listen to what Matthew said in his gospel about a future coming. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes, even to the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Church, do you know he's coming? Listen to what John wrote in Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, so it is to be. Amen. I want you to think about that. That, that is... If anything's true, that's true. He's coming. And so that, that first stanza in the poem, God's faithfulness in the past assures his trustworthiness for the future. And so that, that first part, point two, really captures God's attributes and his resume to this point. We continue on with that theme a little bit in point three that we're about to unpack. And this one becomes more explicit scripture about God hear this, God acting on behalf of his people to save them, in wrath remember mercy, and God acting in wrath to crush his enemies. That's what you're going to see on point number three. So point number three, let's tackle that. It's almost quitting time. God acts in power to save his people and crush his enemies. He acts in power to both save and crush, save his people, crush his enemies. And So think about this. What kind of an event is God's coming? Is that a glorious reality or is that a terrifying reality? What do you think about that? Which is it? What do you say? Glorifying. Who said that's glorifying? I think that's glorifying. Who says terrifying? <laughs> right, so wait now. Y'all, y'all like the blizzard, you know, the DQ blizzard. Like, which is your favorite? This one that y'all said terrifying and glorifying. How can that be? Now, here, here's the key. It depends on if you have experienced God's mercy. Everything turns in wrath, remember mercy. If you're on the wrath side of that, I want to tell you, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 37 said, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And maybe you're sitting here this morning, and maybe your heart rate just like picked up a little bit. That is a good thing. If that's where you are, don't leave that thought. God shows up. John said in Revelation 1, 7, every eye is going to see him. There won't be that crowd like, I'm going to tell you, I'm not looking to him. I'm not bowing to him. I'm going to tell you, it will be every eye under the orders of the living, visible, present Lord Jesus Christ. And there will be that great division of those who have experienced his mercy. And that, here's how you experience his mercy. How do I do that? Here's what I want to tell you. You do one thing, and there's two parts to it. You turn from your sin, and you trust in Christ as your Savior and Lord, and you will experience God's mercy. Not cheap grace, not like, yeah, I'm going to do that. No, I'm telling you, if you will, if you will like settle the issue and you'll turn from your sin and yourself, you'll repent, and you'll turn and go in a new direction, you'll trust in Christ. I want to tell you something. You will go to the camp that will say that's a glorifying reality. You go, that's too simple. Not as glorious. It is on some level simple. So let's unpack this. You say, you're telling me all this. Show me. Well, verse 2, 
in wrath, remember mercy. We don't have a billboard, but if we had one, that was what we'd put on there this week. In wrath, remember mercy. What is wrath? We could give a longer definition, but God's holy. I want you to track with me on this. God's holy, furious anger at sin, evil, and sinners. People say this all the time. I don't agree with it. God hates sin, but you could finish it, but loves the I'm just going to press a little bit, and this usually this make you think. God hates sin, and God hates sinners. Ponder that. Feel that hostility. God's going to be nowhere. His righteous wrath is nowhere sin is. And so, by the way, that makes us run to the rescue. Because see, how's God? So, yes, God loves you. He loves you so much. Now, stay with me. He sent Jesus to die on the cross. You know that if you're sitting here this morning. And I'm telling you that if you had not heard it. And I'm telling you, if you don't run to Jesus, there's nothing God can or will do for you. It will be all wrath forever. A billion years, you got a billion to go. A billion years. Think about that. Stephanie and I had this conversation. What if we are deceiving? I, no, I'm serious. She goes, you're trying to make me doubt. Yes. You ever have this thought like, what if I'm just playing a game and I'm a phony? You ever have a, thing, a thought like that? Work through that sometime, right? I'm going to tell you, there was, there's nothing funny about being in hell for a second, much less a hundred trillion years. Right, and so I want to tell you, God hates sin, God hates sinfulness, and God hates sinners. And if you're a filthy sinner, all the rest of us were before He saved us. Run to Jesus this morning. We're gonna sing a closing song. You could get saved now. Nail that down. Say, Jesus, I'm a filthy, wretched, rotten, hopeless sinner. If I die right now, I'm gonna meet your wrath. But God, I don't want your wrath. I want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He'll save you. And this is real. It's more real than the hospital. It is. It's real. Let's get to the text. All right, look at verse 8, chapter 3. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Now, now look at the attributes. God's rage, the Lord rage against the rivers. Was your anger against the rivers? Was your wrath against the sea? God, were you mad? Were you angry at the sea and at the rivers? Is that who God was angry at? No, he's angry at his enemies. Stay with me. That you rode on your horses. Look at this. On your chariots of salvation. So we got wrath and salvation. We got rage and salvation. We got anger and salvation in the same verse. Verse 9. Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. Selah. Pause in worship. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming. Now, I want to give you one quick reference on that one. Sun and moon stood in their places. You see how powerful God is. Listen to Joshua 10. Joshua 10, verse 12. Then Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ashelon, So the sun stood still and the moon stopped until the nation avenged themselves of their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? The sun stopped in the middle of the day and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. Now, who at your work can do that? And you're out there making good time on a project and it's lunchtime like, dude, I'm just going to keep it like high noon for like the next 24 hours. Hey, man, I don't want to watch that. Y'all can't pull that off at the nuclear plant, can you? No, y'all making power over there, but they can't. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. There was no day like that before it or after it when the Lord listened to the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Look at that. He's crushing his enemies and fighting for his people. He's crushing his enemies and fighting for his people. Do you think we can trust one that can stop the day and keep it right where it is? And that's never happened before, never happened after, and that's an easy thing for him to do. I bet he's trustworthy. What do you think? That's what he's saying in his prayer. Bad days are coming, but man, let's put it in perspective. We can trust him. Look at verse 12. Back to those words toward his enemies. Look at this. 
In indignation, you march through the earth in anger. So here's what I'm going to say. We've shaped a God in the United States of America that it's a newsflash when we read the Bible. And verse 8 says God rages and God's angry and God's wrath and that God has indignation. The, the American God doesn't have indignation. Sin is light and silly and not serious. And I want to tell you, that is a damning proposition. It is. Amen. It, it is because we will think we're safe when we're not safe at all. And I want to tell you, people that love you, tell you the truth. God's told us the truth. I am so grateful that I can read about God's wrath because, hear, hear this, not only can we read about God's wrath, we have been rescued from his wrath. Why we come to worship on Sunday? I want to tell you something. We have been rescued from the wrath of God. He poured out his wrath on Jesus, dealt with our sins, and now he's given us Jesus' righteousness. We've been brought into the family. God our Father, Christ our brother, we sing. Yeah, but I hadn't thought about it when I sing. Think about it. Christ is our brother. In indignation, verse 12, I'm trying to quit. In indignation, you march through the earth. In anger, you trample the nations. Okay, I told you the point is twofold. God acts in power to save, crush, save his people, crush his enemies. We're getting to the saving part explicit. Look at verse 13. God, you went forth for the salvation of your people. You know God's got a people? Oh, that's good. You went forth. God acted for the salvation of his people, for the salvation of your anointed. Now, you hear salvation of your anointed in Habakkuk 3, verse 13. And you know why that heartbeat is? That's pointing us to that coming anointed that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we have all of our, we are more blessed than Habakkuk was, by the way, because we've got the rest of the Bible. He went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. Look at this. Now, this is strong. You struck the head of the house of the evil to lay him open from thigh to neck. Then that's, that's an avenging warrior, wouldn't you say? Sell a pause and worship. So salvation, two times in verse 13, you went forth for the salvation of your people, salvation of your anointed. I want to tell you that ultimately he's pointing us to Jesus. Listen to what Paul said in Colossians 2. Here's our testimony. If you've been born again, here's your testimony. When you were dead in your transgressions, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Let me ask you, I know we say this all the time, what can a dead woman do for herself? What can a dead man do for himself? I want to tell you, you talk about a gracious salvation. Those of us that have been born again, when you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And look at this. He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them. And all the wrath we deserve was nailed to the cross, and Jesus bore it. In wrath, God remembered mercy. So, what difference does it make? Let's just finish up verse 14. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. He's given picture, by the way. Do you know the Old Testament shows God so confuses his enemies that they destroy themselves? People march around like, hey, let's march around and like sing some songs and see if some walls will fall down. It's in there. Go read. I'm telling you, it's an amazing book. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on the sea with your horses on the surge of many waters. So when that dark day came for Habakkuk, God had him write a song, listen to this, of triumphant faith. The dark day came, God said, you write this prayer, this song of triumphant faith. And we can add a verse based on the truth that we have that he did not have. And so what difference does it make is where I was going and where I want to land is where we started on our darkest day. When the news comes and it's tragic, when everything changes, when our knees buckle, when we get the phone call, when the diagnosis comes, we can sing, Jesus is better, Jesus is greater, Jesus is stronger than anything we'll ever face. We can breathe our dying breath saying, Jesus is better, Jesus is greater, and Jesus is stronger. And we know we are weak, broken, feeble, and needy, but Jesus is strong on the cross 
God in wrath remembered mercy. Right, and that, so you go, are we more like the people of Judah or like the Chaldeans? I want to tell you, we probably resemble both. But glory to God, he has shown us mercy. And God, Colossians 1.20 tells us, through Jesus is reconciling all things to himself. The justified one by his faith will live. As our brother read, nothing will separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Two application points and I'm done. Number one, allow God's faithfulness in the past to steady us in dark hours. Allow God's past faithfulness to steady us. I, and I, that word steady us, don't, don't you feel when life really hits you hard that everything is disjointed and out of control. We can be steadied by this reality that God is faithful. He is trustworthy. And second application, you go in the darkest hours, I just want to fall in the floor and I want to question God. No, in the darkest hours, hang on to who God is and what God has done in Christ calls for our worship in good and bad times. And Job said, in these darkest hours, bad news on every Corner, Job 1, verse 20. Listen to this. But then Job, I started to say he had lost everything. He had not lost everything. He had lost a lot. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshiped. Isn't that beautiful? Hey, it's beautiful. You go, oh, man, reading Job's hard. It is hard. He fell to the ground and worshiped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And I love verse 22. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. In a culture that wants to blame God for everything bad, I want to tell you something. Here's what we forgiven ones know. We are privileged to know God, and, and hear this. In the worst of time, let's trust God and worship God. You talk about a testimony. Trust God and worship God. I've had a hymn. I'm going to read a verse to you, and then we're going to sing it. And if you don't know it, you'll be blessed by it. I think most of you know it. Everybody I've asked does. How many of you know, like a river glorious? How many of you know that? Right? Listen to verse 3. Think about Habakkuk. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing and worship. Listen to verse 3. Like a river glorious, every joy or trial falleth from above, traced upon our dial by the Son of love. We may trust him fully, all for us to do. They who trust him wholly find him wholly true. They who trust him wholly find him wholly true. And then Habakkuk in his Shiganoth, let's call this our Shiganoth this morning, okay? Here's our Shiganoth. In his Shiganoth, he's calling out to Jehovah. Listen to the chorus. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed, finding as he promised perfect peace and rest. In the storm, in, in the time of the Chaldeans coming, in the darkest, in the knee-buckling moments, stayed upon Jehovah. Hearts are fully blessed, and we will find, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Father, we thank you for Christ. We thank you, God, that in wrath you have remembered mercy. God, we thank you for so great a salvation. We, Lord, change our thinking. Lord, we, um, we think so unbiblically. God, we thank you that you are powerful, that you are holy, that you are good, that you are patient, that you put up with my complaining tendencies, Lord. Thank you for this passage, and Lord, you are trustworthy. God, our fleshly human tendency is wanting to blame you for the bad and to take credit for the good, and God, we, we repent before you in that, and Lord, we thank you that Lord, life, death, principalities, powers, height, depth, nothing will separate us, God, from your love. And we thank you that you have called us, that you've predestined us, you've justified us. Lord, you will glorify us. And Lord, I'm mindful of many, many hurting people, many that in our body are in dark hours, God. 
Lord, this is timely. And so I pray that, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would encourage and build up and strengthen and refresh. And God, we thank you that you can, you can pause the sun for a day. You can divide seas, part rivers. You are powerful. You're good. God, we thank you that you didn't come to us in your wrath. You poured out that wrath on King Jesus and he drank the cup. God, help not one of us to take that lightly. God, help us to worship and trust as forgiven people. God, may our mark of our lives be a resolute trust in you. And we can't do that. Lord, we can't even have the desire to do that apart from you. So would you give us that desire and the power to live that out? God, I pray that you would, Father, apply this word to your church today. However that needs to be done, we trust you in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing and respond however God has spoken to you. people said amen and amen let me call your attention you don't have to sit down church family as you go out the door guests you're welcome to take one of these two you'll find a green sheet with some nice guys handing those out and this shows you our budget through eight twelfths of the year so through august i'll call your attention to one thing that's praiseworthy where there's multiple but if you go look at those line items where we give a percentage of our budget alabama baptist children's home Baptist Medical Dental Mission International, Gideon's, International Mission Board, uh, Southeastern Seminary, Southern Seminary, Southwestern Seminary, North American Mission Board, you will see that we should have spent 67%, you know, two-thirds of the year. 
And you, we've spent 76%. What that tells you is we're significantly overgiving the budget. That's a good thing, right? So praise the Lord for that. So that's why that number's inflated. And then I also call your attention, you'll see this on the back of your green sheet. We are diligently trusting the Lord and sacrificially giving to pay off all the debt associated with all of our 26 acres. And as you know, we, um, we put, I don't know, well over a million dollars in the property and buildings. We borrowed a million five oh seven about 20 months ago. And you'll see this past week, we dipped under 1.2 million. So you'll see that's now 1,199,000 and some change. So praise the Lord for how he's blessing his church. And we give this to you. Any questions, ask me. Miss Julianne, we work closely on the finances. We would do our best to answer those. But again, guest and church family, get one of these. You go guest, it would be a great opportunity for you to see where the money is spent in um, God's church. Mr. Joe, would you come and close us in prayer? And we will not be meeting at 5 o'clock. Small groups to start next Sunday at 5. Mr. Joe. Let us pray. Father, it's, it's been a joy to be in your house this morning, dear Lord, to hear your word expounded, preached. And uh, thank you for our pastor as he studies, prepares, the enthusiasm as he preaches, dear Lord. And I pray as we go from here, I pray our lives would reflect uh, your truth, reflect your love for one another. Reflect your peace as we deal with life and all that comes forth. I pray that uh, for those, there's dear Lord, here or away that are hurting and dealing with things, dear Lord, bless and minister peace and comfort. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.